through tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2006 Thanksgiving Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dr. William Knoll is the speaker of the afternoon teaching on weapons of our warfare. First I want to talk about the weapons of our warfare and then talk about uh, walking in victory. The weapons of our warfare. The first most powerful weapon that you have is forgiveness. Because if you don't forgive, nothing else you do will make any difference. It is the doorway. You know, God has devised a home for you, a safe haven, a refuge, where nothing can touch you. And it's made out of feathers. He said, I will cover you with my feathers, and under my wing you shall take refuge. And so, you want to take refuge in this feather house with a wing over it, and the door to get in is forgiveness. You have to forgive people who've hurt you. If you don't, you're standing out there in the rain, in the dark, and it's raining on you, and there's lightning and thunder, and there's bomb outside there, and you're blind and you can't see them, and they're picking on you, and you're boxing, or you're like somebody boxing in the dark. Now, forgive means to give up the resentment against, the desire to punish or pardon, to give up all claim to punish, exact penalty for an offense, or to counsel or remit a debt. It basically means that you don't want to see people pay for what they did to you. You give up all right to repayment. You give up all right to see these people pay. I didn't hear you say for But what they did to you. I like one definition. It says give up the right to revenge. That comes out of Webster's New Third International Dictionary. To give the right, give up the right to revenge. Remember that revenge belongs to God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And so you let God take care of that. Now don't be like the little old lady who had the bad arthritis, and she came in for Bill Banks to pray for. Bill said he was talking to her, and he said, "Do you have any?" Any resentment against anybody? You have any unforgiveness against anybody? He said, oh, no, no, no. That's a sin. I have forgiven everybody. I don't have any resentment against anybody. And after he, and he kept getting unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness. And, and so he kept probing around. And finally her nephew that was with us said, well, what about Aunt Susie, Grandma? And he said, a veil came down. And she said, I have forgiven Aunt Susie. I've turned her over to God. God can get her up better than I'll ever be able to. He's going to make her pay for what she did to me. It sounds funny, but it's sad. She was hiding behind religious posturing for years and was now so disabled with arthritis she was in a wheelchair, and still behind religious posturing, I have forgiven. She didn't. When he said, I had explained to her what it meant to forgive, she walked out of that place that night. Nobody had ever explained to her that to forgive means to give up the right to revenge, to see people pay for what they did to you. She was praying that God would get even for her, that God would take care of it. Nobody had ever explained it to her. And she was hiding behind false knowledge and religious posturing and suffering badly with arthritis. And Matthew 6 says, If you forgive men your trespasses, your heavenly Father will give you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. I can show you that. It's also in Mark there. It starts off with this bit about moving the mountain by faith. And then it says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. And your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. 
In Luke it says, forgive that you might be forgiven. Matthew 18 is the most chilling verse. I talked to the men about it this afternoon. That the master was angry. This is the unforgiving servant. You're all familiar with that? The master was angry, delivered into the torturer until he should pay all that was due. And so my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Now the torturers are sadistic demons that love to torment you. That word comes from a, a word, Greek word that meant to uh, test money to see if it's real or not. And uh, it got transferred to people who tested your testimony in the prison. And they were just sadistic men who would torture you to see if they could get you to change your story. That's what the demons are like. And they couldn't have, they couldn't hire ordinary folks to do that. I mean, you know, it would just, you couldn't sit there and torture people and have them scream in pain and be normal. And so they went out and got sadistic people, people who were sadists, who loved to torture, made them feel good to hear somebody else scream. And those are the tormentors. And they are the demons, right there. And they love to torment you and torture you. And so, if you don't forgive, those are the gentlemen there that will be waiting on you. You've seen this uh, picture of, of the hillbillies with their guns and said, I skill, polite, wonderful crew is waiting to serve you. Y'all all seen that? I have a picture of my family taken back about 18, 1890. They were all standing on the front porch. And they were standing like this. And they had to, had to pose, you know. And it's the most meanest looking bunch of folks I've ever seen. So my son put it on the television, put it on the computer and made a Christmas card and said, the Noel family welcomes you. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. Everybody wrote back and wanted a copy of the picture. <laughs> Where did you get that? Who are those people? Our great-great-grandfather, that's who it was. And I have the great-great-grandmother. I know which one she was because I have the bracelet, I mean the necklace she was wearing. My aunt gave it to me. And she was the one who was the uh, astrologer. It says that you've heard, you heard that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For well, he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and on the just and the unjust. God says, pray for your enemies. And to God belongs mercy and forgiveness. You want forgiveness? Forgiveness is a gift of God. When you pray for your enemies, pray that God will be merciful to them, then uh, you'll get forgiveness and you'll get peace. And he will have mercy upon you. Now look at this one. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And what measure you use, we measure... Now, the marginal reading in the King James Version says, Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. With what condemnation you condemn, you will be condemned. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, what do you want measured back to you? You want mercy measured back to you? Or you want condemnation measured back to you? Judgment measured back to you? you want Judgment measured back on you. Or do you want come, or you want mercy? And when you pray that God will be merciful to the people who've offended you, hurt you, that He will be merciful, He will be as merciful to you as you asked Him to be to them. That's a law of Scripture. That's a spiritual law. There it is. And as surely as the sun rise, when you ask God to get even for you, you can look for that judgment to come back on you. It's the law of sowing and reaping. As you sow, so shall you reap. Okay. Now, God is absolutely just. And He does not wish anyone. He loves every one of you. He loves the sinner. And He does not wish anybody to be hurt. He wants to be merciful. In Exodus 34, 6, the nature of God is revealed. And it's not on the slide, so open your Bible. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, 
And him, Moses, is getting ready to go back up on the mountain, get the second, get the law again, get the, with the second set of plates to have God rewrite the Ten Commandments. Write them again. So he broke the first pair. And the Lord descended in a cloud, stood there before him, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now when he proclaims his name, he proclaims his nature. In Hebrew, the name indicates the nature. Verse 6, And the Lord passed before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Now those are special words, Hebrew words, used 13 times in the Old Testament, always in relationship to God, and 11 times they're used together. What do they mean? The word book, the theological word book of the Old Testament says, merciful means to pick up and stroke in love. Gracious means for a greater body to reach down and pick up a lesser body. I said, Lord, show me what that means. And he, re- he showed me in a vision of once when I punished one of my children. I spanked him for something. I don't know what. And he was crying. And he turned and he grabbed my leg and was crying. And I reached out and I picked him up and I held him and I caressed him. And I was crying and I said, Son, you're going to have to learn that rebellion has painful, painful consequences. I love you very much, but you cannot rebel like this. And I just held him and cried with him. And that's God. That's how He feels about you. He is absolutely just. He must judge sin. But He wants to be merciful. And when you remit someone's sin, that's what He says, those sins you remit, they are remitted. When you remit that sin and say, Oh God, don't make them pay for it, Lord. Be merciful to him. He can look at all of the circumstances involved. He knows things you don't know. He knows their harm. He knows all sorts of things. And he will make a just judgment. And that's God's business, not ours. Thank God. It's his business, not mine. And so, you don't judge. You pray for your opposers. For those people who've been spiteful and nasty to you. Now, the battleground is in your mind. Now, look at this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that's fleshy, but mighty in God for the pulling down of a stronghold. Now, if you look that up in the dictionary, it's a redoubt or a fortified place. The place got a lot of armor on it. Casting down arguments. That's imaginations. That's things that rise up in your mind. Logical arguments, imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity with the obedience of Christ. And so in your mind, you have got to pull down the armor that the enemy has protected and stand against him, analyze your thoughts, and not allow the enemy to put thoughts in your mind. Thoughts. Look at that. first one we'll look at is 2 Corinthians 2.11. It says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, in uh, Ephesians it said, we are not ignorant of the wiles of the enemy. And that word is methodius, which means methods. It's different methods. But this is a different word. This word means thoughts or mind. Let's look, let's follow it through Scripture. Here's another place, 2 Corinthians 4.14. Whose mind, same word, the God of this world, of this age, has blinded. Do not believe, lest the lie of the gospel should shine on them. So he's blinded their minds so they can't hear God. He's blinded their minds when they read Scripture, it doesn't make sense to them. Look at this one. It says, Rejoice, and again I say rejoice, that your prayers and petitions be known to God with thanksgiving, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard. Now, if you look that word up in Thayer's Greek-English Dictionary, a lectionary, Dictionary, it says, to garrison with troops, to surround with troops so nothing goes in and nothing goes out. Now, Old King James says, keep. Guard your hearts and minds there, that's thoughts, through Christ Jesus. And so, God... Peace of God will keep the enemy from putting thoughts in your mind and other evil sources. And here we have it again. For the weapons of our warfare are carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. 
bringing every thought to captivity. Now, what are the sources of thoughts? You decide to think about it. You know, you decide you want to think about that. Okay, you're driving down the road, and a thought comes into your mind. And you said, I decided to think about that? No, I wasn't thinking about that. Did the Holy Spirit bring it up? No, the Holy Spirit wouldn't bring that up. And so you only see you got another source of sin. Sin in your body. Sin in your body. Well, let's look at that, uh, some of those words from sin there. The first one says, uh, Romans 5.12, Therefore through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because of all sin. So sin entered Adam. Something called sin entered into him. And it entered into you because you're a child of Adam and you've got it by inheritance. It's there. Now here Paul says to born again tongue speaking Christian. Ain't no other kind in the first in the first century. Therefore do not let sin reign or rule in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. So apparently it's alive and well in spirit filled Christians. It's there. But Paul said, don't let it rain in your rural, in your, in your mortal body. Don't let it be the boss. Another place says that, uh, our old man was crucified with Christ, that sin might be rendered inoperative. And that is a marginal reading, but it's the reading that Derek Prince says is the most accurate. Come on, bud. He says, now if I do what I, we are not to do it no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So this sin can force you into things if you let it. But the law of life, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin. So it's a law, like gravity. It's a law. It's there. And you can stand against it if you are in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, then that law is nullified. But if you're standing in the flesh, it's got authority in your life. Now, second thought is flesh or soulish desires. Romans 8, 7 says, Because the carnal mind, that's the fleshy mind, is in enmity against God, and is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. That's your flesh. Those that are in the flesh are under a curse. You know, I came into the church one day, and I heard the chief elder in there, and he had a group of uh, elders and the ushers in there, and he was bragging to them about, literally, about how he had gotten into the flesh out where he worked, and how he had given all these people, man, I got in the flesh, and I really told them all, and I told them about it, and I told them this, and, and I listened to him. And all those men went, yeah, yeah, boy, yeah, that's good, that's good, boy, that's good you did that. And I just looked at him, and I called him by name. I said, you're the chief elder in this church, and here you are, you put yourself under a curse by getting into the flesh and cursing all those men, but now you are proud of it, and you involved all these innocent men who are subject to you here at the church because you got them to agree it was good, you put them under the curse. Don't be ashamed of yourself and repent. I'd like to say he, that, he, that he repented, but he did not. His flesh, he just... He sloughed it off. Now James 1.14 says, Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And so you see, you have your own desires. It comes from your flesh. And the third, fifth source of demonic beings. Now where does it say that a demonic spirit can put a thought in your mind? Well, let's look at John 13.2. The supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, he projected that thought into Judas. Now, Judas was a sinner. Judas was a thief. He said he carried the money bag, and he helped himself to it. He was a son of perdition. Jesus said he had a demon. He said, I've chosen you all. One of you got a demon. But, put it in his thought into his mind. Now, demons can be either in you or outside of you. But they can project thoughts into your mind. And so you have these three. You either got sin, you either got sin, if the sources are sin, flesh, fleshly desires, or the flesh. Foolish desires. If it's not that, it's demonic. Now if it's sin, flesh, or soulish desires, you say the Lord rebuke you. 
I'm not subject to you. In the name of Jesus, I'm not subject to you. I don't have to obey you. I've been set free by the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to do that. And you push it out of your mind. If you can't push it out of your mind, it keeps coming back, then it's a demon. A demon, you bind. The binding and loosening of the foundational in warfare. The first is forgiveness. Then when you start to fight, it's binding. Walk in the flesh. You can walk in the spirit and the demons will still harass you. You walk in the flesh, flesh and soulish desires will disappear. What are you doing? Well, sometimes, you know, you have to stop and just start praising God. Just say, oh, Jesus, quote Scripture and just turn your back on it and walk off from it and refuse to look at it. You know, I was, I was at the health club last week. I normally go at 4.30. No, no, I pray in the morning. I used to go at 4.30. I used to go at 5 o'clock in the morning when I had company, but now I come down here and pray every morning. And so I go at 4.30 in the afternoon. I finish at the, at the library, and then I go to the health club and exercise. But I was late, and I got there at 6.15. I left. I got dressed, and I went up there, and I have never seen so many women in skin outfits in all my life. I decided that I would exercise tomorrow. And I went out and took my eye and, and changed clothes and came home. I fleed. <laughs> because I just didn't want to fight that. Those soulish that I mean I just I mean it was praise the Lord. Now you bind the demons. Now we have a number of versions then I want you to look at first. Look at Matthew twenty nine, twelve twenty nine. How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then we'll plunder his house? Now, to bind, what does that mean? If you look it up in Strong's Concordance, it means to bind up with chains, to tie it up with chains. About 15 years ago now, I was, uh, I woke up one morning. And I had what I felt like was a 25-pound sack of flour sitting on my chest. I had a heavy weight. And I opened my eyes, and there was this big cobra snake coiled up on my chest, and he was all hooded out. He was weaving back and forth. And his beady little eyes were looking at me, and he was sticking out his tongue. Being God's man of faith and power, I pulled a cover up over my head. I hid from him. And a sweet little voice said, you can bind him. So I pulled the cover down just below my eyes and I said, I bind you in Jesus' name. And a hand came out with a shackle and a chain on it. One hand, one hand, one and the chains tightened up and he they took him out of the room, out through the door. I thought, how interesting. And then this huge black water spider who had a belly as big as a wash tub with long legs, most horrible thing, you know came crawling through the door of my bedroom. And uh, I said, I bind you too. In the name of Jesus. And then they chained up every one of those defendants and they pulled him out. And I was sitting in the bed. It was not a dream. I was wide awake looking at it just like I'm looking at you. It was an open vision. And I said, now Lord, what does that mean? I was getting ready to come down here. So I finished getting dressed, came on down here, and uh, met Mildred and Jim Coffey. And I said, I had this interesting vision this morning. And so I explained it to him, and we decided we would fast and pray and ask God to show us what it meant. We all had ideas, but we, we said we want revelation. And Jim came back to me about the next morning, I think. I can't remember exactly now. He says, Doc, you've been really blessed. I said, how's that? He said, you got to see what happens in the Spirit when you bind the Spirit. In the spirit world, when you bind the spirit. And God immediately quickened to me Psalms 149. It says, With the high praises of God in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand, you shall bind their kings and nobles with feathers of iron. This is the privilege of all the saints. I said, Okay, Lord, I understand. But why, Lord, if sometimes I'm being harassed and I'm just... I keep binding it and nothing happens. So I had another vision. And here I was walking down the road. 
And this line of demons was walking. One was right there whispering in my ear. And behind him was a stream went all the way across the hill. And they were walking lockstep, you know. And I'd bind one and the angels would grab that first one and haul him off and the next one would just step right up, you know, like nothing had happened. And he made me see that I'd bind that one and he'd haul him off. He made me see, you know, that it, that uh, they one of them's getting bound every time you bind him. But the enemy's got a lot of them. And uh, if you keep on binding them, Eventually, he's going to decide. You know, he doesn't have an infinite number of troops. He's got a finite number. And he's going to lose 200 or 300 of his troops. He's going to say, this ain't working too well. I'm losing this fight. And so he'll pull it off, and he'll run his his mouse around his computer screen. he said, oh, this method works against his grandfather. We'll try this one. And so he will wait a more opportune time and come back with another method. He don't ever quit. And so... uh that's what it means to bind. Now look at this one. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes and overcomes him and takes away all his armor. Now what's the armor? That's that stuff around that redoubt, that stronghold we talked about. That's all the, the armor he's got. That, that's the curses. That's past unforgiven sin. That's past vows you've made that you haven't repented of. That's the sins of your ancestors. That's all the legal rights he's got to say. And that's armor around him. And you can't get it out till you get all them legal rights. As long as he's got a legal right, he's going to stay there. He said, you can say all you want to, but i got a legal right to be him. i got a right to be him. i got authority to be him. I've been yielded to. I've been invited in. So you have to break down that armor. That's what you do when you bind and break curses. Repent of vows. Repent of sin. Take away the armor. Then you can divide the spoil. You can drive him out and take his goods. They overcame him. They, as the believers on earth, overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Now, most folks got, they, they, they claim the blood, and they have, get their testimony. But this part right here, they have a little trouble with. You've got to be willing to die. What is that? Revelation 11, 12. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, the devil and his angels fought, and so forth and so forth. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. They are the believers on earth. Remember, the angels can't appropriate the blood, and they don't have any testimony. Jesus said, He who loves his life, Lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will keep it. He's got to be willing to die for the world. And this applies, and this is the first place where binding is spoken of in the positive. He says, him, Jesus is talking to Peter. And I asked for the, this is the new King James. I really wanted the King James, but this is what I got. I say to you that you are Peter, and on this, I, I'm going to quote it to you in the King James. I say to thee that you, that thou are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. We're talking about the rock, the revelation that he is the Son of God. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are used interchangeably in Peter about the same thing. And interchangeably with the other in the other gospels. Only the kingdom of heaven appears only in the gospel of Matthew. I said the gospel of Peter, the gospel of Matthew. And whatever you, whatever thou bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever thou loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is given to you to use in the area of your authority. It's given to an individual. It's given to you for your family, for the people that God has placed under your authority. It's given to a pastor for his flock. It's given to a prayer group leader for the people that if that. The pastor has committed to her care or his care to pray for. It's given when you are under authority and authority has been given to you. You have authority over your family, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. I think the authority extends over into your brothers and sisters and cousins if you're saved. And you're praying for unsaved family members as a household. I can show you that in Scripture. We'll move on. And so that's the key. You bind it. So you bind it on heaven, in earth, 
and it'll be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, when you bind an evil spirit and break its legal authority, then you are loosening yourself in heaven. I believe, and I can show you in familiar spirits, that all your sins and all the legal rights the devil has, he records in books. He's got familiar spirits that around you all the time that are watching and report to other familiar spirits that, that fly away. That's all in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And the, uh, and so when you loose yourself, you're loosing, you, you see, you're binding that legal right. You're tying up with chains and, and, and you'll loose yourself from it, which means you destroy it. You know that word that, uh, the scripture says, for this purpose the Son of Man was manifested, he might destroy the works of the devil. Are y'all familiar with that? The word destroy there is the same as loose. And so you're destroying the legal rights they have to harass you. And so you bind up these things. This is the foundational thing. You bind the enemy. And God will tie him up with chains and haul him off. That is the privilege of all the saints. Now, look at Matthew. Next place it talks is Matthew 18. More of your brother sins against you. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you gain your brother. But if he will not hear, take one more, one or two more, that by the mouth of three witnesses every word will be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen tax collector. Surely I say unto you, you see this context is to the church. Surely I say unto you, plural, whatever, that should be ye, plural, whatever ye bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again I say to you, that if two of ye agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Does that mean that uh, you can call up your friend on the phone and say that, uh, I want you to agree with me, I'm coming under, I'm, I'm, I'm a little short of cash today, and I'm coming under attack, and I need an extra $10 in my bank account, so would you agree with me that God's going to put $10 in the bank account? Oh yeah, I agree with you, fine. Now, that's sort of an absurd example, but I've already done. That's not the kind of agreement. It's not a mental agreement. That word in the Greek is symphonize, from which we get symphony, a musical harmony. And so when two of you symphonize on earth concerning anything, come into the Spirit together in spiritual unity and harmony, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Well, where Two or three are called or gathered together in my name. I'm there in the midst. I like called. It means you've got a leader, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you can come into agreement with the Holy Spirit, you can get two people to come into, into hard, spiritual harmony with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have what you ask for because you're asking according to the will of God. And it says if you ask according to the will of God, you know God hears you, you'll have what you ask for. And so... Here you can bind all kind of things. Just be sure God has called you. Be sure that you've gone to your pastor, your spiritual overseer. If you want to go bind the, the sorcerer on the corner down there, the lady who's uh, got the, the, mind, the, mind, the mind reader, the fortune teller, and you decide you want to bind that, you can check that out with your pastor. And you pray about it and see if God has called you to do that. I remember so well this young man in New York at a church and he wanted to go down and minister to the punk rockers which were about two blocks from the church and he went to the pastor and the pastor said you know you've got enough to do here son pray that God will raise up someone but you've got enough him you handle what you got him well he said you know I'm sure God wants those people to hear the gospel so he went and that which put a curse on him that took him five years I prayed for him here, and finally, after five years, we were in morning prayer meeting, and he'd come down, and he was still suffering from this curse, having all kind of problems. And I broke, and God said, I, I don't know, I just heard I come out of my mouth, I break the curse of the witch. And he did a double flip and hit over him, but he was free. Didn't hurt him. You know, if God puts you down, I don't ever use catchers. 
If God puts you down, you're not going to get hurt. If you God puts you down, you will not get hurt. If you do a courtesy drop for me, though, you might uh, blow us hard. But I, but I hold on to you, though. You're going to have to pull me over with you. The, uh, I, you know, God does put people down. And God, I've seen Him put, I've seen Him put, throw people six feet across the floor and hit so hard that the change came out of their pockets. And in some cases, I got thrown with them. But none of us got hurt, and God healed them. Something, a significant, something significant happened. I see people, I used to see people when I was in church in my hometown. I see these people go up there, and man, it was like a mowing machine. They just drop in, you know, they catch them, drop them, drop them. And those people get up and come back, but nothing happened in their lives. I didn't mean to get into that, pardon me. I'll get somebody's sacred cow. You can have a demon that puts people on the floor, too, you know. A pastor can have a demon. I remember we cast one out of it in Winworld. This Catholic priest said, man, you stole my anointing. Because he could say, in the name of Jesus. And they dropped. Cast that demon out of him, and he couldn't do that anymore. He was moving spirit. That wasn't the right spirit. So that's binding and loosening. Does anybody have any questions about binding and loosening? It is the most important thing. You bind your children. You got away with children. You bind them every morning. You get up. You bind their feet to the paths of righteousness. You bind deception over. You bind sin. You bind seducing spirits. Whatever's happening to them, you bind, you ask God to bring them to draw them home with cords of love. Now, God will convict them, but He will not put a hook in their nose and drag them in. And you can love them into the kingdom of God. I'll show you some scriptures. If we get that. I don't really want to get into that on this tape, but I'll show you some scriptures. You have absolute authority to... Okay. You know, I want to... I spent a little longer than I really wanted to on this. I don't I'll never get through this walk in freedom. You know, God loves all you. He loves you so much. And he wants you to come out of sin. And walk in purity and holiness with him. And he said, I've given you all of the authority that you need to walk in pureness and holiness. And to seek me with all your heart and soul and you shall find me. For I love you. I am loving and gracious. I didn't finish the rest of the character of God. He said he is long-suffering. That means he is slow to dilate the nostril. When you get mad, you take a deep breath and, you lie, and, you, and your nostrils dilate. Well, in the, in, the, in the Scripture, it's slow to dilate the nostril. He's slow to get angry. But he forgives sin, iniquity, and transgression. He's full of truth. And mercy, compassion, mercy, same word, forgiving, but imputing the sins of the fathers to the children to the third and fourth generation, not leaving the guilty unpunished. But his son was made a curse on the tree to break that curse for you so that you don't have to live that way. Before Jesus was hung on the tree, there was no way around it. But gee, God says there's a time coming when no longer shall it be said that the children's teeth are set on edge because the parents have eaten bitter grapes. Lots of people teach that uh, that is automatic with salvation. Oh, I wish that it were. It has not been my experience that it is automatic. But it doesn't hurt to break it. It doesn't hurt to break it. If it were automatic, then healing would be automatic too. Because He bore all your sickness and all your pain. You shouldn't have any pain or any sickness if it was all automatic, but you have to claim it. And lots of other things I could talk about, but let's move on. Walk in freedom. You know, you need to review the family history that's that in the back of the book. I've got a, on the back of the book up there, I've got 18 pages of family history. I talked about it on deliverance for children, but you need to review that. And then you uh, make a list of your weaknesses, or your hot buttons, the things that really bother you, the things to avoid. And then he says here, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run the race with endurance. It requires endurance. It requires that you get away from that sin that ensnares you, the thing that always upsets you. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. Woe to the men by who they come. Offense. The word offense comes from the word skangula, which means a trigger on the trap. 
Paul says we will strengthen, well, they strengthen the believers and encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships. And uh, that word there is tribulation in the New King James. We got the wrong translation here. It's tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Where did the word tribulation come from? What does it mean? It came from the Greek custom of putting a, a thief between, between two rocks and pressing him. Press up. To fess up. Or else they, in uh, early colonial times, they stayed you out spread eagle and put a box on your chest and filled it full of rocks. And ready to confess? No, we'll put another rock in there. It got to the point you were lifting this heavy weight of rocks every time you breathed and eventually you suffocated if you didn't confess. And so... You're going to come under, or you're going to have, you're going to be offended, you're going to be offense, it means a stumbling block, or a, a, a trigger or a trap, you're going to, going to be baited, and you're going to be pressured, take it. And in Timothy it says, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And if you look that word up in the, King, in the dictionary, it means to be pursued. And so the devil is going to pursue you. He's going to send somebody to set the trap for you. He's going to pressure you to take it. And if you run away, he's going to run after you. Just know what you're up against. He ain't going to leave you alone. And don't think you can make a deal with him. I've had people make deals with the devil. How can you make deals with a liar? A man whose native tongue is to lie. I mean, you know, he, I tell you, he'll expect you to keep your end of the bargain. He won't keep his. Yet while there has no root in him, but endures only for a while, but when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles from the parable of the sower. Tribulation, the pressure, and the chase after him, he stumbles because he's got no root in himself. Great peace have those who love you law. Nothing will cause them to stumble. you got to remember that a uh, that demon, he knows your weak points. He studied you. He studied your grandparents, your parents. He studied you. He knows all your weak points. He knows all your hot buttons. And he designs temptation to suit you. And he will pursue you. Just remember, great peace, though. Those who love the law. Nothing will cause them to stumble if you follow it. Have the Spirit show it to you. What is the law? What is the fulfillment of the law? Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is a fool. And so the proper response to an offense is, first, you love God's law, and second, you fulfill it by loving your neighbor. You pour out unconditional agape love on those who offend you. Find yourself insulted, pride injured, wounded, fearful, fret, stop. Repent. Ask for God's help. But don't act with, do not respond with harsh words. Shut your mouth. I have a sign I found in the mountains I just love. It says, Lord, put one shoulder on my, one hand on my shoulder and the other one over my mouth. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Grace to help. I mean, God's free gifts. Come ask God. Say, oh God, help! Seen one, a soft answer turns away wrath. Grievous words stir up anger. If you can't say anything else to them, you say, the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. I remember I had a demonized man attack me when I was in the pulpit. And he was a, he was a member of a queer nation. Militant homosexual. I th- and he came charging in and got in my face. And I just looked at him. And all I could see was a tormented soul that God loved. And I just said, the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. He was cursing me and he was saying words I can't repeat. Threatening to kill me. And I just said, the Lord Jesus Christ bless you, my son. And he stepped back. And he said, Try it again. I said, the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. He stepped back. And I said, the third time, he turned and ran out. If you can't say anything else, just bless him. Be angry and do not sin. But you get angry, don't sin. Remember that anger is a work of the flesh. Don't let the sun go down your off or give place to the devil. 
That means if you slip and get angry, goodness gracious, you go, you, you repent and ask forgiveness and settle it. Even if you have to, if you feel that the other fellow's wrong and you'd rather be robbed, somebody asks you to go your coat, give him your cloak too. What did he say? You take an offender to court? Take a fellow, a fellow Christian to court? And you'd rather be robbed? I once had a, uh, Bible teacher at the church he worked. Uh, he had a job that had excellent insurance. He brought his children to me, and he ran up a bill of about a thousand dollars. And the business manager kept asking them when he was going to pay his bill, and he kept saying, "When well, the insurance company sends a check." So finally, he wrote the insurance company. They said, "Well, we paid him," and he said, "Would you please send me copies of the checks?" So I sent copies of the check for the back of them where he had endorsed them, and my partners felt that he had stolen the money, that he had taken the money and spent it, money he wouldn't have gotten if I, if the clinic hadn't signed the claims, and they felt he'd stolen it, and they wanted to sue him. And I said no, but since they were my partners and we shared overhead together, they didn't feel that I had a right to do that. And so I paid $1,000. I wrote my check out to the clinic for $1,000 to pay the bill so they wouldn't sue him. <laughs> Because it would sue him my name. And I just sort of sighed. But real sigh was the next day when I went to church and he showed up in a new suit with a with a new hundred dollar Bible on his hand. <laughs> but the next time he came they told him it was cash. Or go someplace else. That's fine with me. I didn't run the business office. Not only that, but we glory in tribulation. You know, in tribulation it produces patience or perseverance. Perseverance produces character. That's really proven character. And proven character produces hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. There's a story told by the lady named Smith Wigglesworth and said, Brother Wigglesworth, I need patience. Huh? Lord, bring tribulation into the life of this sister. She said, no, 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 Brother Wigglesworth. I said, I need patience. He said, tribulation, bring it forth, patience. Bring tribulation. I told that, and at the end of the table, one of the gentlemen slammed his Bible. He said, I don't ever pray for patience again as long as I live. Oh, praise you, Lord. But tribulations perfect your character. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall in various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect, complete, like him. And so, testing perfects your character. It was fitting for him, for him, all things are all things, and by him are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus was perfected through suffering, and you will become a son of God if you suffer with him. Romans. Now, and so how do you respond? You respond in love, never in anger, never with a harsh word, forgiving and praying for your oppressors, laying those things that you know are going to trip you up. Now, here it says, deliver yourself from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. For my righteous shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, and that, that means he's scared, I will not be pleased in him. We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who believe and are saved. He who doubts is condemned to be eats, because if he does not eat, eats from faith, for all that's not of faith is sin. They, these six things God hates, seven are abomination to him, a proud look and a lying tongue. But if you have a bitter envy, self-seeking in your heart, don't lie and boast against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, that word is soulish, sukesh. But in the King James, it's either translated sensual or natural because the word soulish did not exist at the time the King James was translated. But it's soulish, demonic. And so if you've got envy or selfish ambition in your hearts, it's earthly, soulish, demonic. That's the downward translation. You open yourself to demons. And so what have we got? The first one, fearful, shrinking back. Romans is a lack of faith. Proverbs a proud look. And the third is being selfish. 
those things open the door to, op- to opposition and oppression. And realize that when we act in these ways, we can begin the deliverance process. Look at Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will first humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. First you humble yourself, you pray and seek his face to help turn from your wicked ways, and then he will hear, forgive your sin and heal your land. And so the first thing you do is you humble yourself. Now how do you humble yourself? Whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he'll lift you up. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humbling spirit will retain honor. By pride comes nothing but strife, but the well-advised. Where does it say? So how do you first start the humbling process? One is to have a routine of fasting. Jesus said, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, they will fast. What does fasting mean? It means denying your flesh. Don't eat. There are lots of different ways to fast. You can uh, fast uh, just eat drinking water, not eating at all. Daniel just ate vegetables. He ate no pleasant bread, no wine, no alcohol. He just ate vegetables. You can eat two meals a day, one meal a day, whatever God leads you to. But the, if it does, if it is easy to do, it ain't what God's called. Because He wants you to deny yourself, to set your will and deny yourself. You know, when I was an Episcopalian, we used to, we used to, uh, fast for 40 days during Lent. We'd figure out what you were going to give up for Lent. And so I always gave up something I didn't do anyway. But you're giving up for Lent. Well, I'm giving up this. I'm, I'm giving up eating steak. Well, I'm giving up smoking. Or so forth. Something you didn't do. There weren't any problems to, to do the fast. Where does it say God says humbling, going hungry will humble you? So He humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna. That you might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I eat no pleasant bread, neither flesh, nor wine, Came into my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three full weeks were fulfilled. That's Daniel's fast. Anoint the father given all things in his hand. When he came, when he rose and laid aside his garment, urged himself, poured water in a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet. So he became a servant. Another way to humble yourself is to become a servant and serve others. Let nothing be done through selfish deceit or ambition, but lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Each of you look not after only your own interest, but the interest of others. Let this mind be with you that was in Christ Jesus. And you all know that he humbled himself. There were seven steps down and seven steps up. I could talk an hour about that, but we'll move on. Leviticus 16. Now, then you come to prayer. Prayer and supplication. Remember, on the Day of Atonement, Aaron had to go out and get a bull and bring it in and kill it and sacrifice it for his own sin. He had to give a big offering, a bull. And after he'd done that, then he could come into God's presence to atone for the sins of the people. Aaron shall bring a bull offering, a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself in his house. He shall kill the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. And there we say that you have to forgive. We talked about forgiveness. We talked about that. Therefore, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. That's in Luke. I read it to you out of Matthew, but here it is in Luke. Be merciful. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be forgiven. Forgiven, and you shall be forgiven. That's Matthew. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who faithfully use you. Give to everyone who asks of you. Love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, that your reward will be great, that you'll be sons of the high, for he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. We talked about unforgiveness. We won't hold that ground again. But I want you to see that you must pray for your enemy. You must forgive. You must ask God to be merciful and pray for them. Now look at this. 
If you bring your gift to the altar and remember there that your brother's got something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way and first be reconciled with your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly. Well, he's wrong. Agree with him. While you're on the way, let your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge and you are the officer, and you'll be thrown in prison. That's going back to that condemning business, you see. You settle it. Then go offer your gift. When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you'll be thrown in prison. It ain't a very nice place to be. I heard that iron door slam once. You know, I don't ever want to hear that thing again. And all I had to do was knock to get out. I was in there visiting one of my, one of my students, you know, from the military school. But it made me, it, it gave me the creeps to have that iron door slam. And I didn't have the key to it. It was an office on the outside. I just had to knock and he let me out. But it still bothered me. You don't want to hear that iron door slam. If as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I had a, uh, I told this story several times before. I won't, I won't bore you with it, but I was public health officer, and we had the dog pound. You know, folks get funny feelings about their dogs. And we had the dog. I was on the mail select committee for the dog ordinance. And we met twice a week for several months to discuss this dog ordinance. And we agreed, there were about 15 people on it, and we agreed that we would go with majority rule and not have a minority report. We would thrash it out and go with the majority report. Well, the veterinarians wanted them to be vaccinated every year for rabies. All the vaccine is licensed for three years. Well, the titers begin to fall at the end of the second year. and uh, But it's licensed by the NIH for three years. I went three years. But they managed to persuade everybody else to vote for one year. And okay, you know, I found I, I agreed beforehand. So when that report came out, I mean, it was me and another lady who was uh, at the Humane Society. Her husband called me. And man, I mean, I could hold the phone out to here and still hear him cussing me out. And I said, well, you know that we agreed that we would divide it by majority and it was just you and our wife against it. And then, I told my, you know, and I got to thinking about it, though. And I, I, I went to see him the next day, a couple of days later. And I said, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. You just sneered at me. It's nice to know you can admit when you're wrong. Well... I won't go into what happened with that, but then he had a heart attack. Well, first he had arthritis in his fingers, and he had all his fingers replaced. Then he had his knees replaced. Then he had a stroke, and then he had his hips replaced. Then he had a heart attack, and then he had another stroke. And every one of these, I went to his bedside, and I prayed for him, and God raised him up. He was paralyzed on one side, and God raised him up. I mean, he got up out of that bed that day. And so I went by the last time he had another stroke, and we were sitting there talking, you know, and something how it came up, and a and a and a veil came down over him, and he looked at me and said, "Yeah, I hadn't gotten you yet, but I'm gonna get you for that." Been twenty five years, and I thought to myself, "Oh, you poor sick man." That's all I could think of, and I said, "Well, Merle." God bless you. You know, it's water under the bridge. We can't change it now. I'm going to get you. God bless you. I left. And if he, I left, if he hadn't had another stroke or attack, if he had another, I'd have gone by and prayed for him. I did. I came to God and I said, God, I've done everything I can think of. I, what else can I do? And he said, you released. God restores your soul. Break evil soul ties. As you forgive your oppressors and offenders, ask God to bless them. Also ask him to heal the associated bad memories and break the evil soul ties and release them, the bad memories, the evil soul ties, your oppressors and offenders to God. Just release it all to God. God will show us. It's your problem now. It's not mine. Call back your soul. Because when you get involved in that, you lose part of your soul. I mean, they, 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 they get a hold on your soul. 
But I, I refuse to take offense to him. But if you take offense, he can get a hold of your soul. Do this with rejoicing and thanksgiving, and the peace of God will be with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Be fearful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanks and supplication with thanksgiving. See that word there? I, I can do an hour's study on thanksgiving. It gives you more blessings than anything I know of. Just to be grateful. Just to thank God for everything. It is the will of God that in all things you give thanks. That's what it says in First Thessalonians, last chapter. Let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, health, wholeness, serenity, prosperity, and absence of fear, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, garrison, surround your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. It says, whatever things are good, whatever things are noble, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, think on these things, and the peace of God will be with you. And so, you forgive people, and you pray for them. And you release them to God. Finally, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely. I left some of them out. Good report. Any virtue, praiseworthy. Meditate on these things. And what does the word meditate mean? It's ruminate. You know, the cow chews the cud. He throws it. He spits it back up. He chews it a bit. And swallows it again. That's what you're supposed to do. Meditate on these things. These things right here are not your hurts and your and your aches and your pains, but on all the good things. Things that you learned and received and heard and saw in me. Do these and the peace of God will be with you. Know that all things work together for good for those who love God and call and called according to his purpose. You know that uh you have to realize it can't be done with a fifteen minute prayer, but it's just a lifestyle of prayer. That you follow it, lifestyle of forgiveness, making amends, trust God to bring it. Thank God for heaven. And you say all things work together for good for those who love God. How can something like this? Well, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you don't understand. The Scripture says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things are for God alone, but the revealed things are for us and for our children forever. And so you don't understand it, and you give it to God. Say, God, that's your business. I give it to you. I trust you, Lord. You know, I was when I was standing to be healed. I was sick. The devil was whispering in my ear, "Dial nine one one. You're gonna die." And I've never had such pain in all my life. You can bind only so long. Then I got to where all I said was, "God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you." And I'd go back into shock, and I stayed in shock. I come back. I went on for thirty six hours, but God healed me. You know what can happen to you? Go to heaven. Get promoted. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should turn from your wicked ways. Repent. See, you prayed, you settled all your offenses, you asked God to show you what your sin is, now you turn away. Don't let it reign in your mortal body. You turn away from it. Repentance is a interesting. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, Greek is a, is a language of the mind. It says to change your mind. It means to be convicted in your conscience and say, no, that's wrong. I'm not going to do that anymore. The Hebrew is an action language. It says turn and walk away from it. And so the two words, one is that you that you change your mind. You say, yeah, it's wrong. I'm not going to do it anymore. And you turn around and walk away from it and don't do it anymore. That's repentance. Repentance is not coming up here to the altar and slobbering and crying and all over the altar and, and, and getting prayed for then go and walk out the door back into sin Never look back. What does Jeremiah say? Surely, after I was turned, I repented. And after I was instructed, in other words, after he knew it was wrong, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed. Yea, I confounded because I did bear the reproach of my thigh. How many of you, all y'all strike your thigh and blush when God convicts you and be ashamed? And then turn and don't do it anymore. Praise you, Lord Jesus. The wisdom from above is pure, peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Right, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We don't have a high priest that cannot sympathize with us. He was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. 
Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Find mercy. Thank you, Jesus. He cares. Now, honor your parents. Honor your father and mother that you're going to live a long time. That says, honor your father and your mother. The Lord has commanded you that your days will be long and it will go well with you in the land. Now, you want things to go well with you? Honor your parents. You notice that those two, those are two straight commands. It doesn't say honor your parents if they've been sweet to you. Honor your parents if they've been good to you. Honor your parents if they treated you nice. Honor your parents if you're proud of them. It just says you want things to go well with you. Honor your parents. You speak honor to them. He who strikes his father or mother will be put. He who curses his father or mother will be. Don't say bad things about your parents. Put a guard over your mouth when it comes to your parents. You bless them and honor them. You think of all the good things. If you can't think of anything else, say they gave you life. Thank you, Lord God, that you gave me parents who gave me life. Honor their memory. Honor them while they're alive and honor their memory when they're dead. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you you rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest over me. Don't re- don't reject knowledge. Pursue the true character of God. What is our mercy, not sacrifice? Here yeah, I've already I've already gone through this once. The Lord descended in a cloud. I think it is so important for you to understand the heart of God. People, God loves you. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He is merciful and gracious and long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. That word there, goodness, is the same word translated mercy there. He desires not the death of a sinner, but he should turn from his sin and live. He wants to have many sons and daughters. He doesn't want you to go with the devil in his bunch. Make no doubt about it. The people who choose, refuse repentance, refuse God, the call of God. And follow the devil. They go into the pit of fire with him. And God weeps over it. He weeps. But that's the law. That's the spiritual law he set up. And he weeps for you. Know the heart of God. He loves you. He's like the father of the prodigal. You know when the prodigal repented? Did he repent when he was in the hog waller and he saw the hogs eating and he thought about the servants in his father's house? Is that when he repented? Oh, he didn't repent then. What did he say? He said, I'm going back. And he said, the servants in my father's house, he's better than this. I'm going to go back and say, Dad, make me one of your servants. He wanted another employer. He was getting, he wanted a better boss. And he came back. And his father was waiting and he saw him far off. And he ran to meet him. You ladies have that wear tight skirts that come down to your feet. You can't run very well in them, can you? That's what the father's gown looked like. That's what a rich man's gown looked like. He could take short steps. To run, he had to hike up his skirt and expose his nakedness, his thighs, like a common laborer. And so he hiked up his skirt and he ran to his son. And when his son saw him coming, that he had humbled himself and exposed his thighs like a common laborer. He said, Father, I've sinned. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He didn't ask for a job. He repented when he realized how much his father loved him, in spite of the way he treated him. And you've got a loving father. That I was a product. I came home. My father met me. He forgave my sin. He made me. He put a robe on me and a ring on my fingers and shoes on my feet, accepting me back into the household of God. That's how much He loves you. You need to know how much He loves you. Oh, God. God, show Him your heart. Finally, brother, we confess the sins of our fathers. If we confess their iniquity, the iniquity of our fathers, how they were unfaithful to me. I walk contrary to them. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is in us. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So your father loves you. You honor your parents. 
You come to God, you confess your sin, turn from it, and you're ready to bind and cast out demons. Place all the curses under the blood of Jesus Christ. Break your sin. Remember that the curses can go back ten generations. Christ redeemed us from the curse. He vowed. Look at this. Here he talks about this. If a man vow a vow unto God, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, but he shall do all that proceeds out of his mouth. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. How many of y'all make vows that you don't keep? I'm going to lose 20 pounds this year. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to tithe painfully every month. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And you don't do it. You grow, you bound your soul with a bond. And God says, I have no patience with food. You don't keep the vows. Repent of the vows that you've made that you haven't kept. And ask God to put a guard over your mouth so that you don't make foolish vows. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my mouth, in my name, they will cast out or expel demons. That word there can be translated expel. That means you will expel demons. It means they will come out of you if you believe. Who does this? Some special people know. Those who believe. We know in all things God works for good for those who love Him and according to call, call, called according to His purpose. Or give no place to the devil. So you break them, repent of them, in areas of sexual sin that call, confess each sin that the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance and break each curse. An evil soul tie, call back your soul, release the foreign soul. Bind these spirits, expel them. The spirits of air and wind and breath Expel them out of air passages, cough, yawn, deep, and out of other orifices too. They come out sometimes, they don't smell very good. Eight steps to walk in freedom. Always walk in love. Remembering that God works good. Give no place to the devil. Control your thought life. We talked about the sources of thoughts. Don't allow yourself to daydream, engage in fantasy. Fill your mind with the Word of God. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to God, giving thanks always to God, the Father, the name of the Lord, and submitting to one another in the fear of God. Let the peace of God rule in you, which you will call at the word of Christ go with you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing other in psalms and hymns and spiritual, singing with the grace in your heart. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks. If you can't do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't do it. Have a routine of fasting. Read your Bible. Remember, faith come in by hearing, by hearing the Word of God. So when you read your Bible, read it out loud so you can hear it. You ought to read through the Bible at least once a year. That's three and a half chapters a day. If you're serious, you ought to read it through it three or four times a year. It don't take you a half hour. Read six chapters, you read it through it twice a year. That don't take you a half hour. Cut the television set off and sit down and get your Bible out and read it out loud. you got children, have to sit down and listen to you read it. Be involved in a church, a routine Bible study and accountability. Have a group of people to whom you're accountable, with whom you routinely study the Word of God, and submit it to church leadership. Pay your tithe. Well, a man robbed God. You robbed me. How have you robbed me? How many, how many robberies are they reporting there? Tithes and offerings. Two robberies being reported. That is God's income tax. When I first got saved, I had a lot of debt, and God convicted me I should tithe, and I went to my spiritual counselor and I laid out all my bills and everything and I was sure that he was going to say, well, Doc, until you get his bill paid, you don't need to tie. Surely you need to, you know, God says pay your debt. And he just looked at me and smiled. He said, pay your tithe, Doc. He said, you pay your income tax? I said, I pay it right off the top. He said, pay this right off the top too. And then, live on what's left. And that's what I did. He says, he will rebuke the devourer. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. It won't destroy the fruit of your ground. Now, every night, you need to read this to yourself out loud. Saying, Bill suffers long in his kind. Bill does not envy. Does not parade himself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek his own. Does not provoke. Bill thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Or keeps no record of wrong. The rejoice in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Bill never fails. Apply that to yourself. 
Read it out loud. Those are the qualities of agape love. And then you review the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, cleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresy, murder, drunken, revelers, and like. You look at each, each one of those and you say, Lord, have I done that? Am I guilty today of these? If they all repent and make it right, and don't let the, the fruit of the Spirit, Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, gentleness. Look for these in your life. Well, they will... For well, if you walk in love and crucify the flesh, you will walk in victory. Don't take offense. Remember that the enemy is going to pursue you to take offense. Where did you come from? Praise the Lord. Well, praise God. Y'all all stand up and let's praise God. Praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord God. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you, Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Praise You, Lord God. Now, in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank You for these people who have been so patient. And I thank You, Lord God. Lord, I thank You. Lord, I just ask now for the outpouring of Your Spirit, Lord. That You reward, Lord. You reward those who patiently pursue You, Lord God, with all their heart and soul. Now, Lord, I ask for an outpouring of your spirit of miracles, Lord God, that you would touch the hearts now. That you touch hearts now, Lord God. That you touch all the hurt, people's hurts, in the name of Jesus. That you touch the hurts, Lord. You break all the evil soul ties to the past. That you would heal, Lord God, the, the bad hurts and memories. I break all the bonds to the past now. All the evil ties, in the name of Jesus, I sever them. I call back their soul, in the name of Jesus. And I ask you, Lord, release your spirit of miracles now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I bind up the infirmity spirits. I bind up the infirmity spirits, Lord, in the name of Jesus. All the pain, for you bore their pain on the cross. I bind up infirmity spirits, because you bore their sickness, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I speak healing now to sickness in the name of Jesus. I speak healing to sickness in Jesus' mighty name. I speak healing. For it is your desire, Lord, that they should walk in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life, Lord. In the name of Jesus, that you will touch them with wellness and health and wholeness, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, just touch them, Lord. Let your spirit flow into them, Lord. I bind infirmities in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I speak healing now to dissension. Healing to hurt in the name of Jesus. God's Spirit, everybody hold up their hands now and just let God's Spirit flow into them. More of your Spirit, Lord. Let your Spirit come down now. More of your Spirit, Lord. More of your healing Spirit, Lord. Just let it flow. Flow, River. You said that the river that leaves the trees with the healing of the nations, Lord. That they just touch them now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. The healing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, God. Let it touch them, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We praise you and we bless you, Lord God. Lord, I speak a release, Lord. This is the year of release, Lord God. I speak a release from the bondage of the past, Lord. In the name of Jesus. All the hurt, Lord God. All the hurt. I speak a release now, Lord. The year of release is at hand, Lord. I speak release now from the bondage of the past. In the name of Jesus. No longer shall they be in bondage to bad memories. No longer to hurt, Lord. In the name of Jesus. But they're released into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, all said amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.